All right, we're in Titus this evening for the Bible study, the book of Titus, just three chapters. And uh, this is one of the pastoral epistles. So if you'll turn to Titus chapter 1, Titus was a Greek young man that was saved and trained under Paul's ministry. Notice in Titus 1 verse 4, Paul says to Titus, mine own son after the common faith. And so, you know, like we talked about with Timothy, Timothy was his son in the faith, so Titus also. Uh, and when he says the common faith, it makes me think of Ephesians 4 where he says there's one faith. There, there's a common faith for all members of the body of Christ. And, uh, that, you know, there, there's a lot to study there concerning faith. There's different kinds of faith mentioned in the Scripture. There's a man's faith in God. There's God's faith, as in His fidelity. Then there is the faith that God has revealed to man to believe, as in a body of doctrine. There are different kinds of faith mentioned, objective, subjective, doctrinal. But when he says, after the common faith, I believe he's referring to doctrine, the faith revealed through Paul for the body of Christ, uh, doctrine that we believe and have in common. But again, Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. Now, Titus is not <clears throat> actually mentioned by name in the book of Acts. Uh, we know he was traveling with Paul in the book of Acts. We picked that up from Paul's epistles, but he's not mentioned by name in Acts, but he's mentioned 13 times in Paul's epistles. Nine of those references are in 2 Corinthians. And so based upon the things Paul said about him, we know he was a, a great help to Paul in the ministry. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at just, we'll read a few verses from 2 Corinthians and kind of get an idea about who Titus was, what kind of, what kind of uh, uh, man he was. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2.13 Paul said, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. So he was really looking forward to Titus coming to help him. He really needed his help. That gives you an idea that he was a dependable, uh, trustworthy, faithful uh, co-laborer with Paul. He said, I found not Titus my brother, uh, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. You go to chapter 7 and, uh, in 2 Corinthians, and notice in verse 6, he said, Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So when Titus showed up, he was a real comfort uh, to Paul. And then in chapter 8, uh, verse number 16, he said, But uh, thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. So Titus cared uh, for the Corinthians just like Paul did. Of course, that care came from God. You know, naturally, we don't, we, we, we can't care like we ought to in the church. I mean, human beings can care to an extent, but the standard that God sets in His Word, the type of care that we ought to have, it needs to come from the Lord. And God put that in the heart of Titus. And I believe God puts that in the heart, especially of uh, leadership in the local church to take care of the church of God, to feed the church of God, to lead, and so on. And then notice in verse 23, he said, uh, Whether any do inquire of Titus, he's my partner and fellow helper concerning you. And, uh, and then in chapter 12, one more, chapter 12, verse 18. I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? So Titus wasn't a charismatic preacher then, right? <laughs> because he wasn't making a gain of the people. You know, these um, uh, prosperity gospel preachers, you know, it's all about trying to get gain. They're in it for filthy lucre. And one of the qualifications for church leadership is you can't be in it for filthy lucre. But he said, Titus, he didn't make a gain of you. Now look, notice what he said. Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? So he, uh, Paul trained him, and he walked in the same spirit and the same steps uh, as Paul in the work of the ministry. So those references in 2 Corinthians kind of help us understand some things about uh, 
uh, Titus. He went with Paul to the meeting in Jerusalem, which is recorded in Acts 15, remember, uh, where there was an issue that came up concerning Gentile salvation and certain ones from Jerusalem said, unless they be circumcised after the manner of Moses, they cannot be saved. And uh, they had come down to Antioch saying that stuff, and, and Paul had no small dissension and disputation with him. So he went up, and, and uh, in Galatians 2 we find it was by revelation the Lord told him to go up and communicate to them the gospel that he preached among the Gentiles. And at that meeting, uh, they learn about Paul's ministry and what the Lord had revealed through him and what the Lord was doing through him. Paul took Titus with him to that meeting. Now, it's not in Acts 15, but we find that in Galatians 2. So Titus went with Paul to that meeting as an example um, of a Gentile who was saved without circumcision. And he was a, a great testimony, and he stood with Paul. And when he got there, evidently there were some trying to compel him to be circumcised after the manner of the law, and he wouldn't do it. He must have been a, a pretty bold young man, whereas Timothy was more the timid type. Uh, Titus seemed to be more like Paul as far as personality was concerned. And uh, so he stood with Paul at that controversial meeting. Some think that Titus deserted Paul in the end. They base that on 2 Timothy 4, if you want to look at that. 2 Timothy 4, verse number 10. Paul writes and says to Timothy, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. And you notice there's a semicolon there. It's not the end of the sentence. And then he says, Christians to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. And some say that it's implied in the verse because of what's said about Demas forsaking Paul and departing into Thessalonica. When it says that Titus departed unto Dalmatia, it's in a negative sense, like he deserted Paul. Now, you can't prove that dogmatically because Paul actually didn't say that. But some take it that way. But there again, you could take it another way and say, actually, Paul's just talking about how he's alone and where different ones had went. He said specifically that Demas forsook him. He didn't say that about Titus. So you got to be careful because, <laughs> uh, I mean, that would be a terrible thing if Titus did that. And if he didn't do that, we shouldn't go around saying he did it, right? It, if the Bible doesn't say it for sure, just, it's best not to try to read. You know, sometimes people read a lot between the lines. And, and I know there are implications in the Scripture, but you need to be careful uh, when things aren't clearly stated. So back in Titus chapter 1. Titus was overseeing the work on the island of Crete when Paul wrote the letter to him. And uh, this says a lot about Titus that he was entrusted with great responsibility. Look at what he says in verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And then he gives qualifications for elders, and he mentions that their bishops, bishop is an office of overseeing, and an elder is a spiritually mature man. Uh, based on the qualifications, by the way, of a deacon, we know that uh, you, you have to be an elder to be uh, a deacon. Deacon and bishop are offices. The elder is, is the man, the spiritually mature man that uses those offices. But my point here is that that's a quite a bit of responsibility that he was left on this island, and there was a lot of cities on this island. There had been churches... Uh, founded in these cities, and he had the responsibility to make sure things were in order. And that, uh, and by the way, a big part of order in a local church is proper governance. Uh, we call it church polity, uh, the structure, the organization. And we need to follow the pastoral epistles on this. Uh, that's our guidelines. We don't need to go to a Bible college and go through a, a class on church polity and learn all the different types of church government, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Congregational, and go through all these details. All we need to do is study the Bible and uh, do things in our church the way the Bible says in the pastoral epistles, <laughs> right? That's what we need to do. And so he had a lot of responsibility on the island of Crete. Now, Crete 
was one of the largest islands in the Mediterranean Sea. It was just south of Greece, and it was known for its hundred cities. It's the island of a hundred cities. And notice he said, ordain elders in every city. I'm not going to stop and deal with this right now. We've taught on this before, but it seems that Paul wanted to make sure there were elders, plural, in every church. Notice he said elders in every city. The implication is if there was a church in a city, there needed to be elders, plural. Uh, God never intended for church government to be a one-man show. Now, the Bible's our authority. We go by the Bible. But he put elders uh, to, to lead in accordance with the Word of God, uh, to oversee. And, you know, we, we, we did a series on this, I think, last year. On, in, in fact, the, the, Paul used the word presbytery, and that, that is a group of elders. And if you look at all the references, it always seems to be that there's more than one. In a church. Now, the number depends on the size and the need. You know, obviously, the bigger the church, the more elders you need to help oversee it. You know, currently, we have two in our church serving. Uh, I'm the pastor. I, do the, I, I have the office of bishop. Uh, I'm an elder. But the bachelor is an elder that has the office of a deacon. And a deacon is as, assisting the bishop in overseeing the work. The word deacon means servant. And there's a distinction, uh, but they're very similar. In fact, um, based on the qualifications for deacon, that's a pretty serious thing. I mean, in other words, uh, this idea that deacons are supposed to just serve tables on the basis of Acts 6, let me just mention to you that the word deacon's not found in Acts 6, and Acts 6 has to do with the kingdom church anyway. So... If you want to understand church leadership, you've got to study Paul's epistles, especially the pastoral epistles. And um, by the way, the local church is not a democracy, and it's not strictly a congregational rule. The typical Baptist setup, for an example, is that you've got to vote on everything. And that, you can't show me an example of that in the Word of God. Um, I think we ought to work in harmony and unity. But God sets leadership, and if the leadership is going by the word of God, the people ought to follow that leadership. We'll vote on some things. I think it's a good idea for everybody to have a part in major things, just like when we voted to change our church name. Everybody voted. I'm not against voting, but this idea of voting on everything that's done, and it's just, it's just it's not practical, and it's just asking for problems, by the way. You know how many fights have broken out in Baptist business meetings? <laughs> I've heard about people even pulling guns. <laughs> the thing is, is listen, if you got leadership in a church that meets the qualifications and they're leading by the word of God, if you can't trust them to make basic decisions on the daily operation of a local church, they shouldn't be in leadership. In other words, if you got to get up and say, all right, we need to order some more gospel tracts, let's vote on it. Well, what do you have pastors and deacons? What do you have leadership for if, you gotta, if the church has to make every decision? You understand what I'm saying? Right? So it's not that the leadership doesn't care what the people think. We're working with the people. But leading is leading. <laughs> and there's not this concept of, you know, the people rule. No, in a church, God rules. It's not a democracy. It's a theocracy, if it's anything. And how does God rule? He rules through his word. Right? We go by his word. I don't want to get off on all that because, I mean, that's, I'm trying to overview Titus, and I can get into a lot of things about that. But we've taught on those matters before, and I'm sure we'll teach on them again. Our desires just go by the Bible, you know. Uh, you have this thing, you have a, a deacon board, you know, and then it's a rotating deacon board. Then you have to have X amount of deacons meetings. Then you have to have X amount of business meetings. Then you got to go by the Roberts Rules of Order, and all that's just a bunch of... Uh, Waste of time. <laughs> uh, it can get just, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not expedient, okay, in many cases. And, um, but again, the leadership is to work in harmony with the people, uh, and, uh, and we're to be laboring together. In fact, let me give you a good verse on this and before I move on. Back, back up to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. This gives you a sense of what I'm trying to say here. <clears throat> 
I, I've been in uh, different scenarios. I, I've, been, I've, I've known of churches that they had to vote on whether to turn the air conditioning on in the summertime. They had to vote on everything. I've been in, other, I've been in a church. They didn't vote on a cotton-picking thing. <laughs> I mean, you did, and nobody had any idea where the money went because not a word was said about it. And if you asked about it, it's because you're disloyal and they run you out. <laughs> now, that, those are extremes. Somewhere in the middle, there's a balance there, right, that we need to find. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. Notice that? Labor among you. And, but watch this, are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So we're laboring among one another. The pastor doesn't have a closer standing in to, with the Lord. We all have the same spiritual standing. Uh, we all have direct access to God. We're all members of the one body. But on earth, there's still distinctions, right? For an example, me and my wife, are, we're saved. We're in the body of Christ. We're one spiritually, but at home... <laughs> I'm the husband, she's the wife, and there's different roles there, right? And in the church, on earth, in the local church, there's still leadership over, it said, those that are over you in the Lord. So people can't say, well, we're on the, we're on the same body, so you don't have a right to be a, a leader in the church. Well, that's not biblical. What's biblical is God put elders in the church to lead, and we're laboring among one another, but, but there are still those who are over you in the Lord. By the way, of course... A pastor's authority is limited to the Word of God. Uh, there are pastors, sadly, that abuse authority. And uh, they tell people uh, to, you know, they, they try to exercise authority outside the boundaries of God's Word. They, they, you know, they try to lord over people. And, of course, we don't want to do that. But back in Titus chapter 1, um, the Cretans did not have a good reputation, <laughs> all right? And if you want to see a case of racial profiling in the Bible, look in verse number 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, Man, that's rough, isn't it? Evil beasts, uh, they're cruel. Slow bellies, they're lazy. And they lie about everything. And Paul said, now, the, that prophet should not have said that. That wasn't very nice. That wasn't very Christian. No, what did Paul say? This witness is true. <laughs> Come on, folks, that's by inspiration of God. See, People act like if you love people, you never say anything negative. Well, oftentimes people to hear, they need to hear negative rebuke. If you love people, you tell them the truth. It's not love to never rebuke anybody. There's a place for rebuke, right? Notice what he said. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply. Did you, see, did you just read that? That's in the Bible. Rebuke them sharply. Now, how do you do that? The Word of God's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You rebuke them with the Word of God, that they may be sound in the faith. So cut them that they might be healed up, right? And the thing is, is that the purpose of rebuke, by the way, is not just to make people feel bad. It's to bring them to repentance. It's to bring change into their life. And they need, to deal, they need to face the rebuke of the Word of God before they can follow the correction and the instruction. And that's why Paul told Timothy, he said, preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season. What did he say? Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. So he said, this witness is true. So you need to really preach to these people because, hey, when you get saved... You know, you're a new creature in Christ, but yet that old flesh is still there and it can cause you problems and you need to grow. And uh, change is a process as far as spiritual growth is concerned. 
So he's saying you need to really rebuke these people because this is their background. Now, the fact that there are uh, the fact that when Paul writes to Titus that there were Christian men on the island qualified to serve as elders in the church is a great illustration of the power of the gospel. These Christians were always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. But now that that, that they've been saved, there there are men there on the island of Crete that they they fit the qualification to be an elder in the church. And you read the qualifications, that's pretty high standard. Look at what he says in verse number 6. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And by the way, that's, that is the balance of the ministry, the positive of uh, exhorting those who are receiving the sound doctrine and then the negative of convincing the gainsayers. And there's always going to be gainsayers. The gainsayers are those who are opposing what you're preaching. They're opposing what you're teaching. What do you do? You keep preaching it. <laughs> you hold fast the faithful word. No matter what people are saying about it, you keep preaching it. And uh, by the way, notice that in Titus 1, so you have these people who were always liar, but what a change has been brought in their life through the power of the gospel. Uh, you know, God that cannot lie can change anybody by the power of his faithful word. I like this in Titus 1. He mentions the Christians are always liars, but look in verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Well, if he promised it before the world began, that, that was the counsel of the Godhead, the Father promising the Son uh, that he would give eternal life uh, to those who had trusted him through his work. He would be sent into the world to accomplish that Christ himself would be raised from the dead and those who believe on him would have eternal life. But he said, God that cannot lie. Hey, he said, these people are always liars. But he said, God cannot lie. I like that verse in the book of Numbers that says, God is not a man that he should lie. I mean, you could trust God. Don't trust people. People, they lie. Even good people who mean well lie. Okay? And sometimes they even believe their own lies. So don't, you got to be careful trusting people, but you can always trust God. He cannot lie. I love that. You know, the Bible says there's some things God cannot do. <laughs> He's all powerful, but he cannot lie. And he cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And, and he cannot, the Bible says he cannot deny himself. He's faithful. And so, verse 9, holding fast, the faithful word. This is a book you can rely on 100%. It will be true tomorrow. It was true yesterday. It'll be true tomorrow. And it'll be true a million years from now. It is the faithful word. It's forever settled in heaven. And so let's give, let me give you a brief outline here. This is very simple of Titus. This gives you an overview of what's in the book. You have the greeting in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. But man, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff in this greeting. Let's read it. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. And the, Now, oftentimes, see, an epistle technically is not just a letter. It is a letter, but it's more than a letter. And when you study epistles, often the theme of what's going to be dealt with is stated right in the beginning. And here it is. Look at it. And the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. That's going to be the emphasis throughout Titus. Godliness, good works, according to the truth. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. So something's been revealed, look, look at what he says, which is committed unto me. So that which was revealed through Paul and committed unto him to preach, committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, of the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. So we have the greeting. And then in chapter 1, verses 5 through 16, 
you have church leadership being dealt with. Now, in verses 5 through 9, it's instructions concerning elders. He's saying you need to ordain elders. There's an order uh, to, to the local church, and a big part of that is having the right leadership. And he said, here's how you ordain elders. Here, here are the qualifications. And then he gives warnings concerning false teachers. Uh, and I tell you, this is pretty strong language. Look at verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. You've got to watch out for those religious people, especially, whose mouths must be stopped. In other words, to update it in modern language, Paul said, Titus, tell those people to shut up. <laughs> whose mouths must be stopped. Why? Who, they subvert whole houses. Teaching things which they ought not for filthy. See, there comes a point we need to tell some people, just shut your mouth. You're causing trouble. That's enough. It stops now. See, Paul told Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be patient to all men. You know? So you've got to be patient, but there comes a point where you say, that's enough. You're, you're subverting houses. You're causing problems. Now we're gonna, you're, this is going to be dealt with, right? And so he says... Um, he talks about these false teachers, especially those of the circumcision, uh, and he deals with that and warns about that. And then in chapter 2 and 3, it's all about Christian living. So church leadership and Christian living, okay? That's a simple outline of Titus. In chapter 2, we have the things that become sound doctrine in the first 10 verses. Look in Ch Titus 2.1, "...but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine." Uh, you know what that means when something's becoming of something. Uh, you say, uh, why that, you tell, like my wife, that dress is very becoming of you. Uh, it's, it's proper, it's suitable, it's, it's favorable to you, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's right for, for, for you. And the things which become sound doctrine, he's saying if you believe sound doctrine, here are things that ought to be demonstrated in your life. Because, look, folks, the Bible's very clear there's power in the Word of God. When you really believe it, it will change you. And it's a, it's a bad testimony to talk about sound doctrine and, 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 and live carnally and live worldly. Sound doctrine produces godliness. And he shows you what that looks like. From verse 1 to 10, he talks about the aged men and then the aged women. Then he talks about the young women and the young men. And he even talks about servants. So look down in verse 10 at the end of the verse that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. To adorn something is to wear it, <laughs> to put it on display. He said you need to put on the doctrine. You need to live it out. Put on the new man. You're in the new man. Put on the new man. All right? And then in verses 11 through 15, we find what grace teaches believers. See, look in verse 11. For... The grace of God that bringeth salvation. Now notice that word for, that's like saying because of, on the basis of what I just said. In other words, there's a connection here. There's no what, how are we going to live by what he says in verses 1 through 10? It's because of verses 11 through 15 we can do that. Look at it. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. See, the law didn't teach us anything, it just condemned but the grace of God. See, the law says, be righteous. Well, you're not, so you're damned. That's what the law says. Grace says, I'll make you righteous. I'll teach you how to be righteous. See, this idea that grace is a license to sin is ridiculous. Okay, and that's a slander that grace preachers often get. But no, Paul's very clear. You know, we're not saved by works. Works have nothing to do with our being saved. It's all by Jesus Christ. And grace, is a, it's, his, it's his kindness toward us. It's unmerited. It's, it's based on Christ, not on us. But yet, when the Lord saves us by grace, he changes us and works in our lives. And this, the grace that saved us will teach us how to live. And notice what he said. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. See, so you've got to get away from that concept that 
The whole purpose of being saved is to go to heaven when we die. Uh, you don't, there's not a verse in the Bible that says the, the purpose of salvation is to go to heaven when you die. The purpose of salvation is to know God and to walk with Him. Now! And thank God we're going to heaven when we die. But He said He'll change you now in this present world looking for that blessed hope. And that's a great motivator in living for the Lord and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. And why did he do that? So we can go to heaven when we die? Well, that's true, but what does it say here? Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what, that's what he's going to do in our life. Zealous of good works. Man. Uh, are you cold? Are you lukewarm? Are you zealous of good works? Where's the passion in the Christian walk? You don't see that very much today, do you? you? You see people get quite passionate about a lot of worldly things, but where is the passion in the church for good works? May God help us with that. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. And so you come into chapter 3, he talks about how to treat authorities. Uh, being in submission to the authority, recognizing the authorities and so on. That's in the first three verses. And then he, he talks about how God saved us. Let's begin in verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Uh, by the washing of regeneration. Now that's not water, that's the Holy Ghost. Washed spiritually. As in Ephesians 5, the washing of water by the word. As in 1 Corinthians 6, now you're washed. And he said, by the spirit of our God. Spiritual washing. Washing of regeneration. So we are, we are born of God. A spiritual birth. Regeneration. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. Which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So Paul's very careful. He talks about we're not saved by works, but he, he says very clearly there ought to be good works because we're saved. All right? Now, then he talks about dealing with heretics. Look at verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they're unprofitable and vain. And a man that's an heretic. That's the only reference to the word heretic, if I'm not mistaken, in the Bible. Uh, there, there's a couple references to heresy. Uh, heresy and heresies, but heretic... You know, that, that gets thrown around quite a bit. Uh, you know who a heretic is? Anybody that disagrees with you, right? You stinking heretic. <laughs> no, they're, a heretic is a very specific thing. I did a lesson one time on that, and it's something you ought to study out and see what the Bible says about it. Uh, but it's, 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 it's more than holding to, to false doctrine. It's, it's holding to it to the point of causing a division and having a sect. And um, it's a work of the flesh, Galatians 5 teaches us. And, uh, but he said, a man that's an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. All right, so go ahead and admonish him once or twice to try to help him out. And if, he, and if he won't listen to that, then just reject him. Now, I've been called a heretic by a number of people. And the people who've done that have not even given me the first admonition. So... I mean, if you're going to call somebody a heretic, you've got to go to the reference to it in the Word of God and see how to deal with it. And if you think somebody's a heretic, if you're any kind of Christian, you're going to at least try to admonish them twice from the Word of God to correct their heresy. But see, the reason why I'm a heretic to some people is because I went against their tradition. Just like Paul. Paul, the first reference to heresy in the Bible is the religious people calling Paul a heretic. They said, Paul said, after the way they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. So, one thing, hey, it says a lot when somebody calls you a heretic, but they can't prove it from the word of God. 
All right? So don't let it bother you. You know, look, am I extreme? Well, what do you measure that by? And I, I am an extremist if you're judging me by your traditions. I am going well past and beyond what people are comfortable with a lot of time when it comes to Bible doctrine, when it comes to things, because they're comfortable with their tradition. And I say, I don't care about your tradition. I want to know what the Bible says. And if you do that, you're going to be considered extremist. You're going to be considered a heretic or whatever. But what are you judging that by, tradition or the Word of God? See, that's, you've got to judge things by the Word of God. And he said in verse 11, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. He said, you, can, you, you know, you're not going to be able to help every heretic. Uh, some don't want your help. So give them one or two admonitions and then just reject them. And then he ha we have the conclusion in verses 12 through 15. Let me say a few more things about Titus here. We'll wrap it up. Like the first epistle to Timothy, this epistle was written after Acts 28, but it's not a prison epistle. Now, base that on the internal evidence that we see in Titus, um, it seems that after Paul's release from the Roman prison, Titus journeyed with him. They preached in Crete because people wonder, when did Paul go to Crete? That's not recorded in Acts. Well, evidently, it was after Acts 28, after he got out of the Roman prison. But you remember, and he was apprehended again and imprisoned again, and that's when he wrote 2 Timothy. But <clears throat> they went to Crete. Titus was with them. They preached there. Paul left them there to set in order things that are wanting, ordain elders in every city. And then whenever Titus completed that work, he was instructed to join Paul at Nicopolis. Look in chapter 3, verse 12. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis. For I have determined there to winter. That doesn't sound like a man in prison, does it? He said, uh, come meet me at Nicopolis. I'm going to winter there, you see. So evidently, this was written like 1 Timothy was between those two Roman imprisonments. Paul wrote Titus around the same time he wrote 1 Timothy, probably in the mid-60s A.D. And Titus is similar to 1 Timothy in that they both concern the proper order of the local church. Both contain, for an example, qualifications uh, for the bishop. And when you compare 1 Timothy 3 with Titus 1 concerning the office of a bishop, I think there's like 24 specific qualifications. That's a high standard, isn't it? The emphasis in 1 Timothy is on doctrine. The emphasis in Titus is on conduct in line with that doctrine. The word doctrine, I've told you this already, uh, is used 16 times in the pastoral epistles. That's quite an emphasis. There's to be an emphasis on doctrine in the church. In 1 Timothy, we are to protect the doctrine. He said, charge some, they teach no other doctrine. He said, war a good warfare. Hold fast to this. Protect the doctrine. In 2 Timothy, proclaim the doctrine. He said, preach the word. In the face of affliction, in the face of opposition, preach the word. Even though they won't endure sound doctrine, preach the word anyway. And then now in Titus, we need to practice the doctrine. The major theme of Titus, and we're about done here, the major theme of Titus is the necessity for good works to be evident in the life of the believer. Let's just read them real quick. Uh, Titus 1, look at all these references. Titus 1, 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, uh, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. Uh, there's a lot of people that profess to know God, but profession is one thing, and a real relationship is something else. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Notice what he says in chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. A pattern of good works. Look at verse 14. He said, a peculiar people, zealous, of good works. Look in chapter 3, verse 1, at the end of the verse, to be ready to every good work. Look in verse 8, at the end of the verse, be careful to maintain good works. Look in verse 14, he said, let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. For So obviously there's emphasis on good works. Again, 
Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But what about verse 10? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, right? Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And he does the same thing in Titus. Here's a book where Paul's emphasizing good works, and he says very clearly, you're not saved by good works. Again, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. So in the book where he's emphasizing good works, he says, you better know you're not saved by those works, but those good works ought to be there because you're saved. See, a lot of people get the cart before the horse. They say you've got to do good works to be saved. You can't even do good works until you're saved because they there in the flesh cannot please God. When you get saved, the Spirit of God moves in. You can do good works through his power. Now, let me just wrap this up by giving you a couple interesting things. There's a lot about Titus, but two things in particular. First of all, no one can read Titus and say the Bible doesn't teach Jesus Christ as God. Now, the Bible teaches that in many places, but Titus, it's very clear. Notice the alternate wording in the following verses. In chapter 1, verse 3, it says, God our Savior, and then in verse 4, it says, it says Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. In chapter 2, verse 10, it says, God our Savior. And then in verse 13, it says, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In chapter 3, verse 4, it says, God our Savior. And then in verse 6, it says, Jesus Christ our Savior. Do you see that? Three times it says, God our Savior, and it follows up saying, Jesus Christ is God our Savior. I mean, he's God. There's only one God. There's only one Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is God our Savior. And then lastly... There are four faithful sayings found in the pastoral epistles where Paul says this is a faithful saying. Listen, faithful saying would be a statement that bears repetition. It's something that you can absolutely rely on and depend on, and it's something that needs to be repeated and emphasized. Now, there's a lot of things that need to be emphasized, uh, but there's four things in particular he mentions in the pastoral epistles, listen, don't fall into that trap where you come to church every week to try to hear some new thing like you're an Athenian. <laughs> the Athenians, you know, those pagans, they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. I've known some guys getting some trouble always trying to come up with a new doctrine. Uh, if you think you're the only one who knows a certain thing in the Bible, there might be something wrong with that. <laughs> uh, and by the way, there's new things that are new to you because you're learning and growing, but they've been in this book the whole time. But there are things that ought to be repeated. There are things that ought to be emphasized. And if you love the truth, you won't get weary of that. I mean, there's great truth that we need to preach constantly. And I don't know about, and, and I've, I've noticed it about people. I've seen people actually get to where they murmur about the Word of God. I say, oh, you preach that a lot. Well, maybe I should preach certain things a lot. Have you ever thought about that? Didn't Paul say to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe? And you read Paul's epistles, didn't he repeat certain things? So you have in 1 Timothy 1.15 a faithful saying concerning salvation. In chapter 4, verse 8 and 9 of 1 Timothy, a faithful saying concerning godliness, that it's profitable not only for this life, but that which is to come. Then in 2 Timothy 2, verses 10 through 13, you have a faithful saying concerning eternal glory. And then in Titus, you have a faithful saying concerning salvation and good works. Now let me just show this to you uh, real quick that he said in verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and people wonder, what is the faithful saying here? Is it what he said in verses 4 through 7, or what he says in verse 8? Well, I take it this way. Verse 4 through 7 is one sentence, okay? And he talks about our salvation, that it's not by our works. It's by his mercy. It's by uh, the regeneration of the Holy Ghost. It's shed on us abundantly. Uh, it's by grace. All these wonderful things. And then he says in verse 8, this is a faithful saying. I think that's what he just said in verse 4 through 7 about salvation is a faithful saying. Now notice this. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. 
I, I take it, and there's a couple different ways to take that, but I take it in the sense that he's saying, if you will affirm constantly this faithful saying, then the end result will be they which have believed in God will, might be careful to maintain good works. Okay, point being this. He said, okay, you, you were saved by simply believing God, okay? But if you will put the emphasis on salvation, on Jesus Christ and who you are in Him and what He's done for you, that'll motivate good works. You, the way to get people to do good works is not to preach to them every week about how they need to do good works. You understand what I'm saying? If you will preach about the Lord and His salvation and who, and who we are in Christ, that'll, that'll bring about good works in the lives of those who believe the doctrine. You understand? In other words, church should not be a pep rally where the preacher gets up week after week exhorting, exhorting, exhorting. And, uh, but the reason why people don't change very much is because they're not learning any doctrine. If you would emphasize the truth of salvation, emphasize doctrine, then that would produce good works in the hearts and lives of those that believe the doctrine. Do you follow that? We ought to put the emphasis on the Lord and not ourselves. There are a lot of people that are not interested in the message unless you're talking to them about their little life and the, their little problems. And you make it all about them. Because everybody's caught up in their own little world. And that's a very sad place to live. There's a big picture. There's a big God who has a big plan and purpose, and you ought to get your heart and mind on Him. I'm not trying to minimize our problem. I'm not trying to minimize our life. I'm saying is we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. And once we do that, that will help us in our problems. That will help us in our lives. When you get self-centered and self-focused, you're not. it's just going to get worse for you. You've got to learn to be God-focused and Christ-centered. All right? So that's Titus. Let's pray. Father.